Our kind Father in heaven, once again, we are so thankful for such a beautiful Sabbath day to come together in Sabbath school and to hear a lecture, dear Father, and then to go out into the field and to meet people that would, that would love to probably be here to hear these things also. But Father, we ask that you be with our speaker at this time, be with those of us that are the hearers, and may we all be the doers of your will. This I pray in the loving name of your Son, Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Testing, testing. Okay, everyone can hear me? Okay, so we're just going into part two. Um, we're going to be covering the books that we're supposed to read, that we're counseled to read. So on part two... Read our health literature to become intelligent upon the subject of health reform is what we learned earlier today. So what books of ours are there to read on the subject of health that we're counseled to read? So what books would be first and foremost? But even more foremost than that. Even more foremost than that. How to live. That was the first health book that was ever given to us. But you're right. It's best to read the books that are not compiled first. Non-compilation books like Ministry of Healing, How to Live, Council, uh, Christian Temperance, Bible Hygiene, Health Reformer Articles. But then you said Councils on Diets and Foods. Okay, so Spirit of Prophecy books. And we'll be going over what they are. There's about 17 of them. First book in Physiology and Hygiene by J.H. Kellogg. Who's heard of that one? I'll show you what it looks like. It's wonderful. We'll be going into that in a little bit. Hygienic Family Physician by Dr. M.G. Kellogg, Merritt Kellogg. We'll be reading what Sister White says about this doctor. He was John Harvey Kellogg's older brother, and he died in, a, in the right position when he died. He did not apostatize from the faith. Handbook of Health, or a brief treatise on physiology and hygiene by John Loughborough. And we'll be going over these and read the quotes regarding these books. The Home Handbook of Domestic Hygiene and Rational Medicine, Volume 1, by Dr. John Harvey Kellogg. And I'll leave this up for you guys to write down. See if there's another one. Okay, we talked about that one earlier. These are the ones we're really recommended to read. And there's two volumes of the home handbook. There's volume one and volume two. I don't know if she recommends volume two, but he did make volume two, but volume one is very fascinating. When you guys are done writing down, let me know. Which one is it you need, Pastor? Handbook of Health or a What was that? Or a brief treatise on physiology and hygiene. That's by Loughborough. And then the Home Handbook of Domestic Hygiene and Rational Medicine. And then I have on here Health Power, which is this one we talked about earlier today. And I also have Encyclopedia of Foods and Their Healing Power. There's three volumes. The two volumes, the first two volumes, hello, son. The first two volumes, um, those are like the educational. Volume three is more like a cookbook, which is real good. It has a lot of great recipes in it. Okay, are we done? Okay. So, Spirit of Prophecy health books. Let's go over these. So... We have a call to medical evangelism. I have them in alphabetical order. Christian temperance and Bible hygiene. That is a non-compilation. It's written complete. She and her husband wrote that book. Councils on diet and foods. 
Councils on Health, Education, pages 195 to 213 is all on health. Health Reformer Articles, Healthful Living, How to Live. How many are familiar with How to Live? That is the very first health book that was given to us by the prophet. Now, she didn't write it all. She wrote six articles. Her husband wrote articles, and she got extractions from other doctors. But she compiled and put the book together herself. Let me know when you guys are done with this one. I'll wait. What would you say? So I've actually read all these books on this page, except I've only read about a third of Health Reformer articles because it's about this big and about that thick. And I have about that much of how to live left, but everything else I read. You still typing? Okay. Huh? And I can, I can email this to you guys. Okay. Cress Collection. That was a doctor named Dr. Cress. He was an Adventist doctor. Thick book on uh, writings to him from the prophet. Loma Linda Messages. Medical Ministry. Mind, Character, and Personality, Volumes 1 and 2. Ministry of Healing. Paulson Collection is about this thick and this long. Excellent book. I love that book. Selected Messages, Volume 2. All of those pages is all about our health message. Temperance. So I haven't read Crest Collection. I don't even have that one. I've read half of Loma Linda. I've only read a portion of Mind, Character, Personality, Volume 1, and a third of Paulson Collection. I read everything else on here. And I'm still going through my Paulson Collection. Let me know when you guys are done writing or typing. You done? We'll go back after. Okay. Yeah, we can go back over these. You almost done there, brother? Yeah? Okay. So we have a lot of health books, don't we? Spirit of Prophecy. Now, a lot of these are compilations. However, you'll get things in one compilation that you won't have in another book. And it helps repetition. It helps you might repeat some things, and then there's things in there that aren't in the other books. So it's good to read all of these books. Now, temperance is excellent. Did you know that 90% of crime in America is committed under the influence of alcohol? That's what the prophet said. I said, wow, if we got rid of alcohol, we'd get rid of 90% of crime. Okay? Um, the previous book that I had... Healthful living, healthful living, it goes by diseases. So it gives you the quotes according to what the disease is. I'll go back to where you were, brother. And then I'm going to change a page in just a moment. Okay? Okay. And then we have testimonies on sexual behavior, adultery, and divorce. We have Manuscript Releases, Volumes 1 through 21, that has a lot of health info. And then, of course, the testimonies have a lot of health information. So we have a lot of books to read, don't we? So does anyone remember what I said to do? Do you read them all at once? No, you start with one book, okay? And if you can only read 15 minutes, 20 minutes a day, keep doing that every day until you get to the next book. And then get to the next book. The way, the order I would read them, I like to read them from the smallest to the thickest. But I do tell people to probably start with Ministry of Healing, even though it's thick, because it's a complete book. 
Um, but, and don't feel like you have to buy them all at once. Buy one, read it. Buy the next one, read it. And don't overwhelm yourself, why well, have to read all these books. Just keep reading the one that you have. And if you do that and carry your book everywhere you go, when you're standing in line, when you're at the bank, when you're at the doctor's office, she said bring our books with us and read. Instead of just sitting there, when you're out to eat and you're waiting for your food, you can read. Okay? All righty. So all books may be found on the Ellen G. White CD-ROM. It's better if you can get the physical book because medical science is showing you retain 20 times more from a printed page than you do an electronic. And we're counseled to invest our money in these books because you're putting your treasure in heaven. Okay. Now other health books of ours that were recommended for us to read. So... She says, it is of the highest importance. What does that mean? The most important that among the studies selected for childhood, what should occupy the first place? Physiology. Physiology should occupy the first place. Regarding the first book in Physiology and Hygiene by John Harvey Kellogg. We have just received from the publishers, Harper and Brothers, New York, a copy of the first book in Physiology and Hygiene by J.H. Kellogg, M.D., who's at the head of the medical sanitarium at Battle Creek, Michigan. The book is designed as a primary textbook on physiology for children from 6 to 12 years of age. Now, I'm going to tell you about this book. 6 to 12-year-olds today would not understand this book. with a summary at the close of each lesson and questions for review at the close of the book. And you guys will see what all these books look like because I have pictures on here. The wide experience of the author as a physician and his skill as a teacher have enabled him to get up a book that is thoroughly scientific and at the same time adapted to the comprehension of children. Moreover, the book is eminently practical. With this book in hand as a guide, we cannot see how any teacher who has a fair knowledge of physiology can fail to make the subject interesting. So, what is the first subject the most important for children? Of course, you need the Bible, but as far as subject, physiology, right? This was the physiology book that they made. Okay, it says it's called... The first book in physiology and hygiene. Oh, he didn't. I'm, I went back. Can you go back one? Right there. The first book in physiology and hygiene. And we'll see what it looks like in just a moment. Okay, so we're going back. It says, with this book in hand as a guide, we cannot see how any teacher who has a fair knowledge of physiology can fail to make the subject interesting. Of course, it is expected that the teacher will have charts, models, and will add many illustrations to that given in the book. But even if this is lacking, we think that the book is better able to teach itself than any other book we've ever seen. So do you want to reinvent the wheel? No. And better, in fact, than many persons to presume to teach physiology and hygiene. We hope to see this book generally adopted in the what kind of schools? They were aiming for the public schools. And whether or not parents would do well to procure it for their children to study at home. Now I'm going to tell you, as adults, we need to read this book if we've never read it. I'm a nurse, and I learned things in this book I didn't even know. I mean, this book is mind-blowing. It, it's powerful. Now, who wrote this? No, no, no. Who wrote this paragraph? Who wrote this quote? No. What year was it written in? Who's EJW? EJ Wagner. What, did, what message did Wagner teach in 1888? The righteousness by faith message. So do you think when he wrote this, his mind was in the right place? 
Absolutely. Absolutely. One of our pioneers is pointing to this book and saying we need to read this book. Okay, let's keep going. And this was the book that they were publishing and giving to all the families. We ready to go on? Here's what the book looks like. Isn't that neat looking? I have this very book. It's very thin. It's about that thin. It's about that long and about that wide. And it's an easy read. And what it does is it has the organs listed or the, um, yeah, the organs of the body. And then it will tell you how coffee harms that organ and how tobacco. So you're not only learning physiology, you're learning the hygiene. And while you're teaching it to your children, you're learning yourself. And I'm going to tell you, your average 6 to 12-year-old of today, this is way above their, their comprehension. Because I started reading this in my 20s and I couldn't comprehend it. They've really dumbed down our educational system. Because this is the kind of reading they were reading back in the day. Excellent book. Okay, can we go on? Okay. I highly recommend this book for all. This is myself speaking, including adults, even though it says it's for 6 to 12-year-olds to read. Our 6 to 12-year-olds of today probably would have a difficult time, but not homeschooled children. They would do fine. Um, difficult time understanding quite a bit of the contents. Even though I'm a nurse and have taken anatomy and physiology, I highly recommend this book, and we went over that already. So let me give you an example here. It brings out points I never even thought of, such as Dr. Harvey Kellogg said, running quickly, unnecessarily. Now, we have what's called fight or flight system, right? If a dog is chasing you and he looks rabid, would you just stand there? No, you're going to take off. If you're going to miss your bus to work and it's the only bus for the day, you're going to let it take off or you're going to run after it? Fight or flight situations. But Dr. Harvey Kellogg said, when you run very quickly or violent exercise, it fills the lungs up with blood very quickly and due to it happening so fast, a blood vessel can break and a person can drop dead just like that. That's in this book. That's why people who haven't exercised in a long time and they're getting on the treadmill and walking real fast and then they drop dead at these gyms because of this very thing. Isn't that amazing? And this is just one little tidbit. This book brings out so many tidbits. I'm like, wow, this is a gold mine. Running over time also produces what is known as a runner's heart, also known as an enlarged heart. Okay, what are we counseled as the number one best exercise? Walking. She says nothing can take the place of it. So why wear out your joints and why jilt your internal organs? Oh, save that running for the last days. Reserve your energy. Save it for when that dog is running after you or something you know is dangerous and you need to get to it quickly. Or a burning house, of course. Okay. Where to read the book online for free, and I'll email you guys this. There's a PDF online, you can read it, but I actually recommend you get the book. It's very inexpensive. It's less than $10. Oh, let me go back. Okay. All righty, we're going to go on. Okay, regarding the Hygienic Family Physician by Dr. Merrick Kellogg. This is the book I was telling you. This book is like this thick, but that's because the print is real large and the margins are real wide. My book is 410 pages. I had it printed, but it would probably be about 200 pages if they made it regular standard size print. This is the title of a work recently published at this office. This is John N. Loughborough. As the title suggests, it is a work especially designed for family use. So it's designed for what kind of use? The style in which it is written is such as to render it perfectly intelligible to all classes. If you can read, it doesn't matter what education you have, you can understand this book. As it is quite free from technical terms and phrases, which are of such frequent occurrence in nearly all books of this kind, which have previously appeared as to render them more or less objectionable. 
It is nevertheless a complete guide for the preservation of health and the treatment of disease without the use of medicine. The work is written in four parts. The subjects treated are part one, health and hygienic agents. Part two, disease and drugs. Part three, the bath, and it's all the water treatments. It's like 60, 70 different water treatments. And part four, diseases and their treatment. And it covers smallpox, whooping cough, things that you don't hear them treat too much today, but you know whooping cough is coming back, right? Yes, smallpox is back. This man used water to treat all this stuff. It is amazing to me. And the remarkable, um, uh, what is the word I'm looking for? Recovery rate that he had, okay? It says, this work is of a thoroughly practical nature and should be in the hands of how many families? Every family in the land. As it affords instruction of the most vital importance. We're in the process of getting this in print. It's not in print. And we're going to have Adventists sell it everywhere. We're supposed to get it in the hands of every family in the land. Directions for the treatment of disease are so plain and minute. What does minute mean? Okay, here's the disease. Here's the instructions on how to treat it. That's how simple it is. Now, some you might see this long, but it's very basic and simple. Directions for the treatment of disease are so plain and minute that any person of ordinary intelligence with its assistance may successfully treat how much of the diseases? Nine-tenths of all the cases of disease which occur in what? Any neighborhood. It doesn't matter where you go in the United States. 90% of disease can be reversed. And didn't Sister White say nine-tenths of our disease can be reversed? The publishers have placed the price so low that the book may be obtained by anyone who feels at all in need of such a work. And this was in 1868. Question. Is this on the, um, the no, this book, these doctor's books are not on the CD-ROM. But I will be emailing you guys where you can get all this. Brother, we were just talking about Dr. Merritt Kellogg's book and how we're told every family in the land should have this book and nine-tenths of disease in any neighborhood could be reversed. Okay. Now, this is the same doctor that witnessed Ellen White having no breath, run, and vision. Remember, there was a doctor on the side, and he checked her pulse, and they put a mirror. It was this doctor. And you can go read uh, John Loughborough's book, Great Second Advent Movement, page 205, to read about Dr. Merrick Kellogg. He was the one who checked her breath and her pulse. No, there are a few things in this book I don't agree with, okay? Now, mind you, it came out in 1868, was in the very beginning of our health message, five years after the prophet got her vision, okay? He says cancer can't be cured. Now, we know it can. Sister White said it can be cured, okay? Remember, none of these men were infallible. He doesn't use herbs. He was against the using of herbs. The prophet came out and endorsed herbs, okay? So if you know an herb works for that condition, you can use it. We can use herbs and roots. Mind you, this was in the beginning stages of our health message. Other than that, oh, and he uh, puts medicinal stuff in the bath water, some of the bath waters. We're counseled in how to live, not to put any medicinal stuff in any bath water. So other than that, all his information is spot on. I mean, good. I'll give you a testimony. My daughter called me one day with such a headache. She tried the foot bath. She tried the mustard in the water. She tried the, she drank, she hydrated herself. And in his book, one of the main reasons for headache is confined study. And she was slamming for her degree. And she wasn't getting fresh air, exercise. And it said do hot five minutes, cold five minutes, a wrap around your head for 30 minutes. She said, Mom, that was the only thing that worked. She tried everything under the sun. And I said, isn't this a mess? Because this is how I found this book. I was on the Pioneer section trying to find remedies for her situation. And that's how I came across this book. And we followed exactly what he said to do to a T, and it worked tremendously. Okay? 
No, this book is no longer available for sale, but um, I'll be adding the link. Here's the link. I'll email it to you guys for sake of time. But we are in the process of trying to get this book in print. And we want to make it available to Adventists. So we're going to sell it to our Adventist people for the retail price one time. And then they'll be able to, then they'll get the info from us where they can get it wholesale and sell it to everyone and put it in the hands of everyone in the land. Amen? Okay. Handbook of Health, or a Brief Treatise on Physiology and Hygiene by J. N. Loughborough. Okay. At the 1866 General Conference session, strong resolutions favoring reform and calling for the establishing of a health institution were adopted. Shortly thereafter, the Western Health Reform Institute was opened in Battle Creek and steps were taken to produce a practical medical book that would instruct and guide along the lines of health principles. So this is considered a practical medical book. The physicians at the institute assigned this task to J. N. Loughborough. So if the physicians assigned him, they must have trusted him, right? He was very knowledgeable about health. Loughborough wrote a lot about health who had led out in the establishment of the institution. The manuscript prepared in council with the institute physicians was more than a year in preparation and yielded a 205-page book compiled largely from standard medical books. Titled Handbook of Health or a Brief Treatise on Physiology and Hygiene. It was published in early 1868. The institute was asked to issue a book on the structure, functions, and care of the human system. Loughborough was already working on the manuscript for this. I have this book, and it's a wonderful book. Very easy read. Very good. You want to know what to do for this disease and that disease? You look in his book and the doctor's books. Since medical workers are large and expensive, it was decided that a small book should be prepared, compiled from the larger works, containing those things essential to aid the common reader in line with the testimony given us. The director of the Health Reform Institute requested me to prepare the manuscript with the understanding that he would carefully examine and criticize it. So Loughborough was appointed to put this book together, and then who was going to examine it? The doctors. You think Kellogg was one of them? Merritt Kellogg and them? Of course. In between state conferences and various board meetings, it took one year to complete it. It was entitled Home Handbook of Health. And this is by J.N. Loughborough. He's the one who wrote this. Now, who is Loughborough? What does the prophet say about this man? Who's heard of J.N. Loughborough? What book did he write? Great Second Advent Movement. We're counseled. Every one of us is to read that book to know our past history. What does the prophet say about him? The influence of Elder Loughborough is valuable in our churches. Just such a man is needed, one who has stood unwaveringly for the light that God has given to his people, while many have been changing their attitude toward this work of God. I say, let Elder Loughborough do a work that is suffering to be done in the churches. The Lord would have his voice. Listen to this. This is powerful. Because something a lot of people don't know is in 1913, Loughborough went to the General Conference session with the 1843 chart and was bringing the people back to the understanding of those messages. But she says the Lord would have his voice heard as was whose? She's comparing the voice of Loughborough to the voice of who? John the Revelator. Not the Baptist, the Revelator. Telling the things he has seen and that which he has heard, which he himself has experienced in the rise and progress of the what? What's the right arm to the third angel? Did he write a book on this health? In Absolutely. Absolutely. Here's where you may purchase the book. You can get it from Amazon. Just type in the title. And here's the PDF to the book. And I'll email this to you guys so you don't have to worry about writing it all down. So if you want to buy the book, which I recommend, purchase the books. We're counseled not to spend money on candies, unnecessary toys. Nothing wrong with toys, just the unnecessary ones. Um, 
ribbons and bows and all these unnecessary trimmings and use that money to get these books. Because pretty soon there's going to be a famine in the land and we're not going to have access to them. Okay, and that's what it looks like. That's what my copy looks like. Can you see that? It's kind of small on there. It's kind of dark. I see what you mean. There you go. Okay, that's a better. Yeah, I'll do lighter next time, Pastor, on a dark background. I didn't know. Okay. And it's paperback. It's about that thick. Very good book. Very interesting read. What other health book of ours are we counseled to read? She says, I wish to state, Dr. Kellogg, I have been forced to inquire why several of our canvassers in this field who were canvassing for the home handbook have left the field having only paid their expenses. They stated that when the time came for them to deliver their books, they could not obtain copies to deliver. They were themselves greatly disappointed, and the people who were expecting the book were also disappointed. What shall we do about this? I have talked to the men in the Echo office about it, and they say that they cannot obtain copies of the home handbook. At every camp meeting, we make special efforts to get before the people the light upon health reform, as contained in your what? Who's she talking to? What was the name of the book? Home handbook, let's go back one. The top, the red letters. If we could go back. Oh, there it was. I'm sorry, brother. Home handbook? Yes, in the home handbook. That's the name of it. So we'll go to the next where we were. But while you have been consuming, you have not been producing. Never was there a time when a greater interest was shown in regard to questions relating to health. What is it that hinders your books from being supplied to our offices to be furnished to the canvassers? Shall this delay continue? Shall the people still be disappointed? So what book is Sister White wanting to get out to the people? This book by Dr. Kellogg. This is a wonderful book. It has physiology pictures that are amazing. He covers diseases in detail. Excellent book. Now what does KC stand for? Crest Collection. It was one of the books of the Spirit of Prophecy we were talking about. Crest Collection. So the prophet wrote this about this book. What it looks like. That doesn't come out very clear. But that's the cover. That's exactly, that's the original book. That's what it looks like. And where you may read it online, I'll send you the link. I'll send you this information. Another health book I highly recommend, which we already went over, was Health Power. This was written by two SDA doctors. As I said, it's not 100% without fault, but it is an excellent book. The Spirit of Prophecy books are going to be without fault. Amen? But not books written by man. Amen? You might find a couple things in there you don't agree with or we know is false, but you don't throw the whole book out. Okay. And this is what it looks like for those who didn't never see it before. Okay. And books that teach us about which foods contain which nutrients, which foods are harmful, and which foods are healthful. What books do you think I'm going to put up here? Huh? Encyclopedia Foods and Their Healing Power. Volumes 1 through 2. You can get the third volume, but that's not the educational one. That's the one with the recipes. And it shows you how to make tamarind paste and how to make Jamaica juice. We were talking about Jamaica earlier. And um, what's that really good, delicious flour red drink that they make in the Mexican restaurants? Hibiscus, yes. It shows you how to make it from scratch. It has all wonderful tamarind tea. Tamarind tea is delicious. It shows you how to make all those recipes, how to make um, all kinds of jellies, and je but healthy, no bad ingredients. Okay, volume three is a cookbook, and then this is what it looks like. And you guys, I had a series, a set, and I used to use them here a lot when I'd teach in the front. So if we read these books, we will really do effective work. 
Now, as I said before, I'm going to email you guys phase one and you can start the training. So you can read a document a day or two documents a day. If you did two documents a day, you'd finish in six weeks. Make sure you answer all the questions. No, you don't have to send me your answers. I'll believe that you answered them. And then... Um, Now, I will be honest with you. Your average one is four to six pages. Your average document takes about an hour with questions and all. Okay? So if you only have a lunch break 30 minutes, you could do 30 minutes and then 30 minutes in the evening. There are about three or four that are 20, 22 pages. And those are your two-month program. Those are your water treatments. And I gave people several days to do those. Like, I think the two-month program, I gave them, like, um, six days. No, no, four days to do that one, four days to do the water treatment. But your average document has four to six pages, okay? And so phase one is all the key components that we must know before we even start this work. And it also has your assessment forms. It has your thank you letters. Um, phase two, no, it has your assessment forms and why God gave us the health message and the dangers of eating flesh and stuff like that. Phase two has your lab work. Everything you need to know about lab and all the results is on there and why each lab is done. It has your basic anatomy physiology. It has your vital signs, how to do all the vital signs. Even gives you the links on where to watch on YouTube how to do these vital signs if you don't know how to do them. Um, it goes over all the laws in, of health in detail as to why we wouldn't eat canola oil, what it does to the body, the harmful effects. So it not only gives you Bible, Spirit, of Prophecy, it gives you the science. So you're learning the, the science as well because we want to give them the rationale. We don't want to just say, don't do this. We want to explain to them why. And then the third phase, and it also covers dress reform for physiological reasons. Like how many people knew if you kept your feet uncovered, okay, you had all your clothes on, but you walk around your house, your feet uncovered, did you know that causes hypothyroidism? Causes hypothyroidism. And so it's stuff like that that we'll be learning. Or what about, okay, how many laws of health do we mostly say? Eight. Is dress included in those eight laws? No, in the eight laws, is dress in there? Dress is not in those eight laws, right? Because we say new start. Nutrition, exercise, water, sunshine, temperance, air, rest, trust in God. Did you know more than half of women's ailments is due to how they dress? Did you know that heart disease and heart failure, if you're working with someone who has congestive heart failure and they wear short sleeves or shorts, guess what we're supposed to tell them to do? Cover up. Because when the extremities that are not covered are chilled, the blood rushes back to the heart, making the chest full, and the heart has to double work. And now you have congestive heart failure. Yes? I can't hear you. What's the difference what? She's going to give you the mic so they can hear you online. Now, we're not talking about modesty right now. We're talking health reasons. Okay. What's the health reason why the difference? Health from, reason for what? Uh, a man wearing pants and a woman wearing pants. What? That's not a health reason, although it is, because we're not only to obey the... the um, physical laws, but we're to obey the what? Spiritual laws. So when Miriam, when Miriam got leprosy, did she break a physical law or did she break a f spiritual law? Spiritual. She broke a spiritual law and she got leprosy, right? If God tells us to do something and we don't do it, that can bring disease as well. People who did not pay their tithes and offerings got stuck, struck with disease. And the Lord told them, and as soon as they paid that tithe and dropped it in the thing, immediately the disease was gone. I've heard stories you wouldn't even imagine. So as far as pants on a woman, that's more modesty. But if we're counseled and we don't do it, that can bring disease as well because of disobedience. But if a person doesn't know better, God winks at their ignorance. 
But so I'm not touching modesty right now. I'm just touching physiological. We're talking about a man wears shorts, a woman wears shorts, a man wears short sleeves, a woman wears short sleeves. The extremities are supposed to be covered at all times. Now, of course, in the wintertime, you wear thicker material than you do in the summertime. You don't want to wear a turtleneck up to here that's wool when it's 90 degrees outside. You would wear thin material, like light linen material. Circulation as far as, well, he was saying, what's the difference between a man wearing pants and a woman wearing pants? There's no physiological reason as far as a woman and a man wearing pants. That's dealing with modesty. It's a modesty issue. Right. It's not going to affect one uh, gender and not the other. Pants is pants, whether a man wears them or a woman wears them. But that's a modesty thing because the women are not supposed to dress like the men. Up until the 60s, 50s, mid-50s, most women in America wore dresses, did they not? Poodle skirts and stuff like that. It was with the whole hippie movement and the roaring, what did they call it in the 60s? where the women started to dress with the pants and stuff like that. But that's a modesty issue. Yeah, that's not, that's not going to affect your health. Unless a woman is told, don't do it, and she knows she's convicted and she does it anyway, then she can have health issues because of disobedience, because she's violating spiritual law. Are you following? We're talking about extremities right now. This is a physiological problem when you don't cover your extremities. Because even in, and I know this for a fact, in the summertime, right here 115 degrees in this summer, okay, I was wearing my thin socks, my leggings, but I was wearing very thin, very thin leggings that didn't make me hot. My sock and leggings separated and my leg was cold. And I was like, why am I so cold? I had a gap like this because my body had accustomed to being covered. So even in the 115, 120 degrees, if you have certain parts of your body covered but other parts aren't, that part is going to be more cold than the part that's covered, no matter what degrees we're in. Do you, is that making sense to you? So it's a physiological, it has to do with blood, the circulation. So can you have perfect health if you don't have perfect circulation? No. Is this making sense? Are you following? Can you have perfect health if you don't have perfect circulation? No, we're told. In order to have perfect health, you have to have perfect circulation. So we really shouldn't be saying eight laws of health. There's more than eight laws. And dress is a very important law of health, but we leave it out of our teaching. And it is a major contributor to heart disease, to heart failure, and to... Um, you know, people having breathing difficulties, shortness of breath, has a lot to do with dress, believe it or not. So, but that's, that's covered in the documents. It goes into detail. Is that making sense? Okay. I wasn't trying to get too technical. Any other questions? So, see, if we read the books we've been counseled to read, we read the documents that has compiled everything under subject for you to make it, you know, simple, so you don't have to wait till you get through all the books to understand. You will really know how to do this work. And let me tell you, the people that I'm training or who've been listening to my conference calls, they have taken off with this work. They're starting ministry. I mean, it's a blessing. And so the Lord wants us to do this work the correct way. Is it the false medical missionary work or the true medical missionary work we want? And what message are we to connect that with? Third angel. Can we teach the medical missionary by itself? Can we teach the third angel? We can, but is it a complete gospel? Are we to teach the, the uh, third angel by itself? No. What did Christ do? What did he combine? Healing and what? Teaching and preaching. Amen? Amen. And so, as we close out, And we haven't even gotten into this. So another time, if I'm available and I'm out here, I would love to do the third part of this. Because we'll go into 
What is the world teaching? What have we brought in? And there's other things that we're not even familiar with. People are doing iridology. People are doing reflexology. There's other things as well. But when we do it the Lord's way, okay, do we need to go to the world to get this work, to get this message? No. How many can honestly say they've read all these books? I haven't. I haven't read all these books. Okay. A lot, most Adventists have probably read two of these health books, your average. And what two health books do you think those are that they've read? That's it. Councils on Diets and Foods. Those are the two books that they've read. And does the prophet say read our books through once and that's it, you're done? Or does she say go back and read them and reread them? When you finish testimonies and conflict series, go back and read them again. Because just like a movie, you know, Back in the day, whatever it is, a documentary, you watch it second, third time, you pick up stuff you didn't pick up the first and second time. It's the same thing with her books. Any questions? And just because someone is healed and just because someone has... Okay, let me give you an example. Who's heard of Charlotte Gerson? The Gerson therapy. It was very... It was pushed very much by one of our medical missionaries who just passed. Okay? Charlotte Gerson, God bless her for the work she's done, but is that our work? Sister White talks about the Salvation Army doing a great work, but she says our work is not the Salvation Army's work. Amen? Their work is not our work. Coffee enemas, do they have good results? Yes, but... The drawbacks outweigh the benefits, okay? There are things that we've brought in from the world. Is Charlotte Gerson a Seventh-day Adventist? No. No, now this is not to knock her, okay? Because the Lord will bless the work. God winks at ignorance. She's doing a great work, but her work is not our work, amen? We want to make sure, okay, here's another thing. I heard someone say this a couple weeks ago, and I said, no. Ellen White did not say that. Somebody who's supposed to be very knowledgeable in health said, Ellen White says we're supposed to do 80-20, 80, 80 raw and 20% cooked. Ellen White does not say that. Where does that come from? Where does that come from? Hallelujah Acres. Who is Hallelujah Acres? They're a Baptist ministry that has a lifestyle center. And guess whose books they read? They read Ellen White's books. But they picked and chose what they wanted. They serve black pepper. They serve vinegar. They eat between meals. They eat fruits with their vegetables. Is that our health message? No. How should we be eating? Okay. That's a whole other topic, but I'll just keep it very... How should we be eating if it's not 80 raw and 20%? But that's a whole, next time if I'm here and the Lord allows it, we can do another talk on that, Pastor. Would that be fine? Okay. I will tell you this. <laughs> How do I say this? Where Do we have a lot to unlearn? Did we learn that today? We have much to unlearn. Okay. Fruit should be eaten in its natural state raw as much as possible. Canned fruit in the winter months if you can't get access to it. Nuts, seeds, eaten raw. Should grains be eaten raw? No. Should they be sprouted and eaten raw? No. They're to be cooked, especially your grains that you make porridge and mush out of. Okay? Those are to have several hours of cooking. Now, that doesn't mean you have to cook them in a pot and make it nasty, mushy. You could put them on a um, baking sheet Stick it in your oven, kind of slow dehydrate to get the, um, what's it called, um, phytic acid out. Because the phytic acid messes with the brain. Okay? Now, vegetables. What are we counseled about vegetables? These books that I just showed you, Dr. Mary Kellogg, Dr. John Harvey Kellogg. I wish I had mine here. I'd show it to you right now. Every one of them said, do not eat these vegetables raw. It hinders the digestion. How much percentage of your, your immune system is in your GI system? Where is the majority of your immune system located? 
okay? If you eat faulty, is that going to mess up your immune system? Now, this is an explanation why people are not fighting cancer. A lot of people, because they do all this raw, they do all this juicing. I had a lady, she had her cancer levels 1,300, which is high. She said, I don't understand. I did all this raw. I'm doing all the juicing. I'm doing everything I'm taught. I said, sister, that's why your levels are high. In one month, she went on the two-month program, and she dropped to 130. In one month, she dropped 130. Yes, and in how to live. But here's the thing. We have been taught incorrectly to believe that cooking your vegetables depletes them. Improper cooking depletes them. You never put a vegetable in cold water and sit it on the stove and let it waterlog until it heats up. You drop it in rapid boiling water and it traps in the minerals. And in our book, How to Live, it tells you each vegetable how long to cook it for. Spinach, one minute. That's it. You drop it in, you take it out, and then you put it in an ice bath. Okay? We're counseled. And let me tell you, when I started cooking this way, because I've had people, they're not eating their vegetables correctly. They're having deficiency in magnesium and calcium, and it's because they're not cooking their vegetables. But it's, this is a whole other topic, and it's in the documents. It's oats. And I wasn't trying to get on this topic. It's oats today. a grain? Oats is a grain. And what about eating it raw? Never eat it raw. It causes lesions on the brain because of the phytic acid. There was a Seventh-day Adventist pastor followed our health message to a T. He was having many strokes. And he said, brother, I don't understand what's going on. He was talking to one of our brothers who does the medical missionary work. And he was following everything. He did the checklist, everything. The only thing on that was he was eating raw oats. He said, brother, remove the raw oats. He removed them, and within less than a week, no more mini strokes, no more lesions on the brains, just like that. So would be Right, absolutely. You're supposed to cook it several hours. On, on slow, yes. What if you put it in a smoothie? What? The oats. It's raw. It's still raw. It's raw. Yes, never eat oats raw. I used to do banana and raw oats and different things and honey and stuff. And I used to have a lot of problems, like with my head and my thinking, and I felt like something was snapping sometimes. I took those out and never had that like, problem again. Like memory loss? No, not memory loss, but like, like something was going to snap in my brain. I don't know how to explain it. I was afraid of getting a stroke. And then I found this information out. The fi it puts lesions on the brain. She says several hours, so a minimum of two to three, but you cook it on low in your oven. I'm not talking about now. If you cook it in a crock pot overnight, it, it gives it a good texture in the morning. But if, you're gonna, if, you're, if you don't have time to do that, you can put it on a baking sheet, stick it in your oven, and then when it's done cooking for three hours, put it in a container and then use it when you make recipes. What about sweet oats? You know, cooking. Um, no, that's not. Only 30% of the phytic acid is removed. No. And, and Dr. Agatha Thrash did a big thing on this as well. You've got to cook the phytic acid out. You have to cook the phytic acid out. Okay, I'm going to ask. Well, let me smoothie. ask. She put her arm up first. I was, I was just going to say steel oats, I think, are the best. You, you steal. Yes, you want to cook them several hours. Yes. But some people think several hours they mean in a pot on the stove. That will make a real nasty mush. The vegetable smoothies. What? Vegetable smoothies. This is what I wasn't trying to get on this topic today. Okay. What are you yeah. mixing your vegetables with? I, I'm just, I don't know. The, not, not with fruits, just vegetable smoothies. All by itself? Yeah. Okay. Raw Have you ever smoothie. read where Sister White said harsh food, coarse food is much better than soft food? We should not eat porridges and mush and take our food in a liquid state. Unless you are diet, like don't have teeth or you're on, um, where you're not able to eat, that's not recommended. So it's not no, it's not helpful. We want roughage. We want to eat the broccoli in the state it was. When you cook it, you know, the florets and stuff, you don't want to puree and because now you're messing with the peristalsis of your intestinal tract. 
Is that making sense? Peristalsis is the wave of your food going down through your tract from when you swallow it, going through the GI tract all the way till you eliminate it. Yes. What is a, uh, the oaks bring lesions? What is a? Puts lesions. What is a lesion? It's like a. Yeah, like sores, like a scab or something. Uh huh. Yes, yes. And that messes with blood flow and other things. It can cause aneurysms. It can cause seizures. It can cause strokes. Yes. From oats. From raw oats. Yes, brother. Raw oats. Not oats. Raw. Yes. Yes. Or undercooked. Yes. Yes. Well, she says the grains that are used in making porridge are mush. Brown rice isn't used for making porridge and mush. Although you can grind it into a powder and make it, but if you cooked it whole, it's not mushy-like. It comes out firm and fluffy. So the grains that are used for making porridge and mush. But we can cover this another time, absolutely. Okay, sure. Um, would you like to pray out for us? Oh, you want me to? Oh, okay, okay. Uh, I'm going to kneel, so if everyone wants to kneel. And remember, everyone, we have much to unlearn, so we're not going to learn it all in a day. Amen? Our Father in heaven, we thank you so much for the information you've given us through the health message, a health message more superior than anything that is in this world, where even we're recognized by the government that we have information in our books such as tobacco and swine and other things. The prophet who is acknowledged by these health gurus of today, every one of them, they've all read our books, Lord. And now that we can take this message, because the rocks have cried out, help us to cry out. Help us to teach the true medical missionary work that you've given us. And may the watchmen see eye to eye. May we press forward, and as we go to the communities every other week, Lord, may we be able to help those in need. We thank you and we praise you and we ask that you be with each and every one of us individually and those who are watching. In Jesus' name, amen.